Okay, now we're going to be talking a little bit about furnaces. Now everybody that, you know, if you've uh, watched the other videos, they're acquainted with the uh, the tri trials and tribulations of our first molder in, the, uh, in existence. The poor fella who almost uh, thought he was going to get killed because he melted the uh, copper ore over an open fire and the uh, you know big wind came along and melted it before he knew what happened well remember you know everything came out okay and he he found out that he was able to take that raw ore and melt it down into copper uh, you know not ingot but to, into uh, solid copper and he was able to you know work with that copper a lot better he's able to upgrade his his uh, I guess you might call it business, you know, and he became well known to all the bigwigs, nobles, the chieftain, and all that. Uh, but don't forget, your well, your you know, fame is fleeting, and so you know. Then after that, it's it, the bosses want you to produce, like anywhere else. They find out how good you are with anything. They want to stretch the uh, the envelope on it and try to push you into doing more and more and more. Well, the boss came up to him and told him, "Hey, you know you're doing good, but you need to start getting more. We've got people, you know, uh, going out there with uh, you know slaves and all that, dragging all this stuff back. You've got the." the guy who makes charcoal in the village here going uh, full bore on having his crew chopping down trees and making charcoal we you know everybody's putting out a lot of effort to give you what you need we want you to make some more so the the, the guy who was you know like the very first molder or the very first blacksmith it would work, starts working over his his little uh, newly made melting area you know it's no longer one of those things where you start heating stuff up and pounding it with a rock you know now he knows how to melt the stuff so he's going he's, he's got it all set up just right to where it's on a, a clay base raised up to where it's waist high where he can get to it fairly easy put put both fuel and ore on it very easy uh, it's all the way he thinks it should be now and you know after many many times of melting stuff it's working real good well he says okay if I've got to make more in a shorter amount of time I'm just gonna start you know packing it up stacking it so he knows he puts down fuel first puts down ore next well he says well I should be able to do twice as much if I put just put down another layer of ore or rather another layer of fuel another layer of ore and that works pretty good except you know the lip around the uh, the bowl that he made it's not very thick and the uh, the ore starts rolling off onto the ground because it's more of a hill than a than a flat so I uh, said he he has an idea he goes to the 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 tribe brick maker and says hey look uh, the boss is on my rear end about making more of this copper or this this shiny uh, metal and uh, you know I need to have you build up the lip so that I can put in more uh, fuel and more ore the guy says okay I, just, I got a pile of bricks right here I can do that so he takes a, a pile of bricks over to the guys foundry uh, furnace you might call it and he adds another layer well that's and, and he you know muds it in and and he gets it all nice and solid where it isn't going to uh, just fall over if somebody leans against it well our buddy is you know pretty happy about it so he adds another layer of fuel and another layer of uh, ore on that and pretty soon he's He's getting, you know, he's manufacturing twice as much raw core, uh, ca uh, copper, I mean. Of course, boss ain't 
I mean, boss is happy, but he thinks he can do more. So over time, as the charcoal became more, you know, uh, he, he's got more charcoal on hand, and he's got more ore being delivered, he starts stacking it higher and higher. Well, here's a problem he ran into. As he was stacking it higher, he was blocking out the oxygen from going down where that first layer of fuel was being and it was getting cooler. It wasn't getting hotter, it was getting cooler. So what he did is he took one of the bricks and moved it and then put a, an air pipe on the other side of the uh, away from the spout. He lit everything off and sure as heck that's what saved it. That, that, that uh, solved the problem. So over time he found that if he put a circle of pipes all the way around he got even more oxygen in there and from that point on he had no problem with getting a nice hot fire melting as much as he needed to melt uh, whenever he needed to melt it but over time as the charcoal became a bigger pile and as the ore became a bigger pile the chief came over and says, hey, uh, what are you having all this very valuable stuff just laying around for? Why aren't you melting it down? The guy says, chief, chief, I'm melting it down pretty fast. You know, I'm making like three times as much as I was before. The chief says, that's fine. I just don't want any more. Of the, I don't want any of this very valuable stuff being laying out in the nighttime you're gonna have people come out here and steal this stuff and you're responsible for it so our, our, our first molder kept building up the high the the wall on the on the uh, clay base higher and higher and higher until he finally got it to the point where there was a balance between supply and demand and for thousands of years this new furnace this new piece of equipment he he invited he invented over time stayed in that shape and did that job for thousands of years matter of fact three well we oh, recently just this year there's been a report from the archaeologists over in China that the Chinese found 3,000 year old let me take that back 4,000 year old furnaces that looked exactly like the uh, this uh, one picture looks uh, that's over in China right there this picture is a picture of cupola furnaces basically in the same form and the same shape as it's been for thousands of years being used by backyard f melters uh, presently alive they've still got all the uh, you know it's basically uh, it's a basic uh, formula for that you, all you gotta do is just keep packing the stuff over you know you have a layer of of uh, fire you have a layer of ore you have a layer of fire you have a layer of ore and you make it as big as you need it or as big as you need to have it be and you know it, it's it's a tried and true uh, design and this next picture is what they found over in uh, in uh, Britain this is the this is one of the the you know refined views of what a cupola looks like over in Britain now in Britain and this is like the very first furnace that was ever you know designed and made to be uh, used to melt metal the very first uh, cupola that they found was brought into uh, introduced into England 
in 1491. Uh, the one in the the one that they found over in China, I've got the paper in front of me now, was dated to 3000 BCE, or as they say now, it's before current era, around 5,000 years ago. So you know that after our guy and you know who devised the, uh, the the very first cupola, as soon as he designed that, nobody ever uh, you know made it made that design any better. They they couldn't. Basically, all they were using for thousands of years was the charcoal that was being manufactured by the charcoal makers. A whole forests were chopped down and burned to make charcoal. I don't know, that might be the, the reason why the land over in Iraq and Iran and all that is, is as bad as it is. But we know that as uh, civilization advanced, people started spreading out even more and more. We know that they went from Mesopotamia, which was in uh, Iraq, they went to, at least to China a few thousand years later and then then they ran into some real good area where they had lots more lots more trees you know to make charcoal and even though they knew about clay I mean about coal they weren't they weren't really f advancing very quickly because they couldn't get enough coal to make all the all the tools needed and adv and advance themselves very far in the smelting of iron now the smelting of iron yeah they finally was able to make make time but the the soldiers of the time in the ancient biblical days they wanted the iron for their swords and their engines of war so slowly but surely uh, it was very, very slow because it happened over thousands of years. Slowly but surely, people spread out, found more fuel to be able to make charcoal, made minor advances in the way they did things, and eventually, everybody in in Europe and up in uh, not everybody, but the the technique of melting metal, smelting it, pouring it and it eventually made its way to Great Britain back then it was England now the next the next uh, advance in, in uh, furnace design was called the reverberatory furnace nowadays you you know anybody who's ever heard of the phrase reverb or reverberatory they think of sound well back then they didn't they didn't have any electronics. They didn't have any, you know, way of making, uh, you know, sound reverberate all over the place. So they weren't talking about sound when they made this reverberatory furnace. Um, here is the first pi the first picture. Here is the outside of the furnace. The large black square on the left. That's where they poured in the fuel. The uh, channel or the thing up on top there it's like a slope that's where they poured in the the ore and then of course the thing all the way to the right was the uh, was the flue that allowed all the gases to go out this next picture is like a cutaway like if somebody took a knife and cut that that whole building open and you get the idea of what they uh, they were working for Everybody knew from the time that the, of, of the first manufacturing of uh, the very first furnace that the fuel was a pain in the rear. It wasn't like the uh, the metal was melting down, pouring down into the to the uh, spout, and then coming out into the mold in a pristine form. There was always some chinks and some some uh you know pieces of wood and you know, all kinds of crap that came along with the metal that got formed into the metal that everybody had to work around so 
they were always looking for a better way to do things to keep the fuel isolated from the uh, the metal and this was was a a way of doing it now over in Britain they had a lot more coal core or rather coal to uh, to work with stone and broad bronze age flint axes were discovered embedded in coal showing that it was mined in Britain before the Roman invasion early miners first extracted coal already exposed on the surface and then followed the seams underground it's probable that the Romans used outcropping coal when working iron or burning lime for building purposes evidence to support these theories comes mostly from ash discovered at excavations of Roman sites by archaeologists there is no mention of coal mining in the doomsday book of 1086 although lead and iron mines are recorded in the 13th century there are records of coal digging in Durham and Northumberland Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire Stratfordshire Lancashire the forests of Dean and North and South Wales at this time coal was referred to as sea coal a reference of to coal washed ashore on the northeast coast of England from either the cliffs or uh, under sea outcrops as the supply of coal on the surface became used up settlers followed the seam inland by digging up on the shore generally the seam continued underground encouraging the settlers to dig to find coal the precursor to modern operations the early mines would have been drift mines or adits where coal seams outcropped or by shallow bell pits where coal was close to the surface shafts lined with tree trunks and branches have been found in Lancashire in workings dirted from, dated from early 17th century and by 1750 brick lined shafts to 150 feet depth foot depth pardon me were common so you had somebody that was designing a new type of furnace knowing that not only weren't they going to be using uh, charcoal they, they had plenty of coal that was being mined by you know the easy stuff like outcroppings and such and so they had a steady source of coal they were also very happy that that they had a steady source of coal because they were very concerned all you know all the nobles and all the chieftains were very concerned that they were using up all of the all of the woodlands by chopping them down and making charcoal so okay so you have a guy who's got a design has got a new idea that he does make some good metal okay yeah, but here's the problem you have to use more coal to melt the same amount of metal even if you're getting green metal I mean good metal uh, you're not you know it's not equaling out you're using more of better to get the same so what they did is after about three or four years in the late 1600s like the 1690 1695 and thereabouts after after less than a decade they stopped using the the uh, reverberatory furnace for melting like you know the the melting of raw materials and they went back to the cupola okay um, that's not to say that the reverberatory furnace is, is no longer exists exists okay it, it's being used around the world today except they're just not using the same material and what material they're using is is less expensive now than it was back when this was first being developed okay now let me get I'm gonna uh, get to next thing all right now the next furnace that was being developed was the the oil fired furnace okay in 1820 there was a power plant in Wales utilize, utilize not, which utilized not only water power by way of water wheel but used a new invention that we know today as compressed air or pneumatic power. Ok. 
okay? Uh, when I say a power plant, the very first thing that you're thinking of is like an electrical plant. Obviously, they, they hadn't developed or they hadn't discovered and, and worked electricity yet. So when they talk power, they're talking the same kind of power that would be generated if you had a horse pulling a sled or pulling a, uh, a plow. It's, it's power, but it's not electrical power. And so this power plant, uh, using natural resources that, you know, water, flowing water, they used the flowing water to turn uh, shafts and the shafts, well, some of the shafts might have had the flat uh, leather belts on them and had machines being uh, operated or, yeah, being operated uh, with the, that power that was being generated. Sometimes the, uh, the power was being generated was for uh, uh, grinders to grind up meal and, and uh, oats and all that. Uh, depended on what they need, what what machine was being used, but it was all power being generated, so those machines could do work and be used. Uh, the new, the new invention, they found out they could make things work by compressing air. That's another form of stored energy. So they, this one place in uh, Wales opened a power plant that used both the regular power they're used to using and compressed power, compressed air. Now if it wasn't for the fact that they had compressed air, this next bit of information wouldn't mean anything at all. After petroleum became a major industry when oil was discovered in 1859 at Oil Creek, Pennsylvania, someone discovered that if you fill the tank with fuel oil, or black oil, what they called it, if you pressurize the tank with compressed air and force the oil through a tiny orifice or a tiny hole in the metal, the oil would atomize into fog light droplets and would be easier to ignite, producing a hot flame. Now the first thing they did when they uh, discovered this is they started making uh, you know, furnaces to heat buildings and to make hot water. But soon afterwards, someone discovered that if you were to introduce compressed air into that same flame, you would have a much hotter flame, and would be that you know that would be generated hot enough to melt both ferrous or iron-based alloys and non-ferrous metals like brass, bronze, and aluminum. Uh, thus was invented the oil-fired furnace. As time moved on, natural gas was substituted for oil, thereby solving the problem of pollutants given off by the unburnt oil and soot being vented into the local environment. Okay, now the very first, well, you got, I've got uh, pictures up here that shows you what oil fired furnaces looked like. And the, uh, the one picture that shows you kind of a white top, that was the oil fired furnace in the, uh, in A school. One of the very first furnaces that I uh, was taught. It was in A school, the oil fired furnace. Okay, now coming around in, uh, oh, was that the 19th century, I believe? Electric arc, no, it's the 20th century. Electric, uh, while, while every, while experiments were being conducted with electric arcs in the early 1800s, it wasn't until about 1907 before a commercial plant was established in New York, where one of the very first electric arc furnaces were used. Electric arc furnaces are refractory lined containers that uses electrical arcs to generate the heat to melt the metal. Once the charge is in place, the roof of the furnace is closed and power turned on. Normally using three phase power, three electrodes of about, I think I read it, they were about four or five inches thick. Three electrodes 
are present that can get, generate about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, both from the arc itself that's generated between the charge and the electrode and the bright white heat being generated by, at the ends of the electrodes. Uh, the white heat being generated at the end of the electrodes, think of them as filaments, like inside a light bulb. Once you are able to uh, establish a good, a good contact with the, uh, the charge, it's, it's in the furnace, it starts glowing because the uh, resistance of the electrode is greater than uh, the resistance in the, in the metal. So it, it's like a filament in a light bulb, in an incandescent light bulb, I should say. Uh, it will start getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Now, that was, that was a, good, a good invention, the arc furnace. I mean, we'd, uh, we'd had electricity being used, and we were developing bigger and bigger machines, and it was no longer a brand spanking new uh, industry or a brand spanking new, uh, you know, you know, it wasn't brand new to everybody anymore because people were starting to get their lights and all that put in. But once these uh, electrodes came down and touched the charge or the, the metal that they're trying to melt, well, it's, it's like welding. You have a whole lot of, of splatter being, being thrown around when the, you know, the very first bit of molten metal gets generated and you've got a lot of smoke being generated because the stuff you're you're trying to melt down you know on a daily basis is basically scrap that you've got from from around the United States so you know it's not pure so you're going to be generating a whole lot of uh, junk that you don't want in your metal okay but it was a fast and relatively clean way of making uh, molten metal and, and utilizing the molten metal for making castings. Once they, but here's a, a guy figured out that if you were able to take two electrodes, bring them to the center of what looks like a big beer barrel turned on its side, one of them is anchored still and one of them is movable, you bring it close to each other, you establish an arc, and you draw the electrode away from the other one until you start losing arc, you've got a big arc putting out a lot of heat, and that's what you have when you have the rolling indirect arc furnace. This is a picture of the rolling indirect arc furnace. Now, indirect arc, as opposed to the direct arc, it's because uh, you're not actually going to be coming in contact with any of the charge inside the, the uh, refractory lined barrel. This is, uh, just imagine a, a cask or a barrel or a uh, keg laying on its side. Okay, somebody drills a couple of big holes in the ends and the electrodes go inside. Somebody lines the keg with refractory now the, uh, the steel lining isn't going to melt in the first half hour of use. And you have a, a hole in this uh, furnace. And, uh, you know, this is one of, the very, one, of the, one of the three furnaces that we were taught in A school. And I'm trying to remember exactly, but I think that the, uh, the hole in the, in the uh, body of the furnace was about a foot square. The bottom of the hole had a spout. And the top, I mean, the rest of the hole, uh, you, you only had that open when you were charging, you know, you were putting the scrap inside the bottom of the, uh, the, the refractory line to barrel. And then you took a big uh, steel casting that was lined with refractory on the inside. You put it back in place and two big uh, thumb, thumb uh, screws you, die, you tightened them down on this and held it in place. Now you didn't, you, all you had to do was just close that and uh, to keep the heat in because the metal was never going to come in contact with that. All right, with any luck, the metal was never going to come in contact with that. Uh, looking at the, the picture there, one side 
I mean, both of these electrodes are three inches in diameter. The machine is operating off of 480 volts. So you bring the fixed electrode in to where it's almost in the center of the barrel. The other electrode you have on the right hand side you have a little uh, handle almost like the uh, cross slide of a uh, lathe. You advance that into towards the other one until you establish an arc. You draw it away until you hear it starting to sputter and that's uh, and you bring it back in just a touch more and you you've got a, a really hot arc uh, running right then now the theory behind that stuff is it's not so much that that arc is going is radiating the heat from that arc is radiating towards the metal and that's melting the metal no it's that arc is radiating 360 degrees heating up all that refractory and that refractory uh, along with the radiant heat coming from the arc is what melts the metal now once that um, that whole process is started you press a button and that barrel starts starts rocking okay the one it's got a limit switch on there well actually a couple of limit switches so that once it comes towards you it'll stop where the um, the spout is more or less horizontal and then it'll it'll stop then and it'll start rotating away from you uh, probably no more than maybe uh, a 90 degree or I don't remember I'll say 90 degree uh, change in angle okay now the reason why that is is that you know this uh, metal is going to be uh, is going to be melted down soon and there's no way you can you can play with it so if you melt this metal down and this thing is rocking it's rolling back and forth on the inside of this refractory and mixing okay any any like if you were to put two different two different uh, batches of uh, non-ferrous metal in there like valve bronze and leaded them um, rather uh, and gunmetal bronze in there you would have some kind of mixture in between and but it would be a, a homogeneous mixture because this the rocking uh, what do you call it, the rocking if from the rocking indirect arc will have mixed all the components of the stuff it just melted into one t one alloy all right one and now you're not going to be able to reach in there with an a uh, an immersion parameter not very not very good but what they did use back then to to read down inside uh, where that metal was was an optical parameter and I remember them using that because in the optical parameter you have uh, both a ferrous and non-ferrous setting on it so once the metal was up to up to speed or rather was up to uh, heat uh, you'd be picking up a preheated crucible like a very small bull ladle but it was it was a uh, crucible a rammable crucible inside a shell a two-man team would go up there with this heated crucible the person uh, operating the furnace would with his uh, little push buttons advance the furnace to where the uh, the spout was pointing downwardly enough and the molten metal was coming out the spout fill up the uh, fill up the crucible and off the uh, guys would go to pelt them, um, to melt the molds now that's the second uh, furnace that they taught us in a school the third furnace that they taught us in a school was the induction furnace and in, in, uh, looking at this this picture the induction furnace is basically a crucible with a coil wrapped around it being held by a shell Okay, that's the bare bones of a, of a induction furnace. Now, the the actual uh, the ones that we used. Now there was a inducto furnace on the school side, and there were Ajax induction furnaces on the uh, 32nd Street side. 32nd Street being a different uh, command 
made up of molders and pattern makers, and uh, they did more production, and we were just learning. Okay, so the inducto, uh, the inducto furnaces were newer. Uh, they were less beat up because there was less production being used on them. And but that was the the first induction furnace that we learned how to use. Uh, looking at this picture, you, you have what is a crucible inside of an induction furnace. Uh, a uh, now this this one here it didn't that's the whole picture right there it doesn't show you anything about whether or not this was a push-up furnace or a lift furnace or uh, a lift and pull away furnace or whatever but here's the deal now you're looking down in there imagine that 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 uh, crucible is not in there what you have is you have a layer of refractory now every time that I ever read uh, re relined a refractory uh, the refractory in a lift coil furnace its thickness was three-eighths of an inch uniform thickness all the way around three-eighths three-eighths of an inch okay uh, the coil itself was let's say let's say about an inch three-quarters of an inch in diameter hollow coil a hollow copper coil and uh, whose job it was was to on the one hand ha allow cooling water to go through it and then on the other hand uh, generate two opposing magnetic forces that um, would force the uh, you know would would create friction between the uh, p the uh, molecules of the metal inside the crucible and and over time and it wasn't very long uh, would generate enough heat to melt that metal. Okay, so uh, the the uh, the first picture of the basic induction furnace didn't show any refractory, so that's why I wanted to show this one. There is a layer of refractory between the crucible and the uh, the coils, so that uh, you know the coils will last much longer and not get any hot spots or and melt down. Uh, how much of a pain, uh, how much of a dangerous thing would that be? Is that if you had 480 volts shooting everywhere because of the uh, because of a whole you know, and water sprue sprueing everywhere, it would be following the water. Uh, people would get killed. Anyway, the next the next picture here. This is a uh, a lift. Um, what what they called a lift crucible. I mean. Yeah, lift crucible furnace. It's uh, it's the same thing as I learned how to use. It's only just a different po uh, different way of uh, presenting the the crucible for the molders to grab and go and pour the metal. The uh, the next picture is a lift furnace, but the lifting part is a cylinder. Uh, I believe that's hydraulic. So the uh, you know you'd have that uh, box around the crucible you heat up the metal it's ready to go you press the button you press the uh, the foot button down the foot lever down there it lifts you push it away from the crucible and the guys come in with the uh, with the pouring uh, shank and uh, take it away now the next picture is more like what our you know almost every one of my lift my my uh, induction furnaces were like. We had a base. We had a box, or uh, yeah, a shell made out of transite, uh, which was nothing more than basically highly compressed asbestos and something else. I don't know what it is. And uh, the the boxes were held in place with uh, flat stock made out of aluminum. And then you had. Uh, you had a yoke attached to the box so that and it was loose so you know when you uh, lowered the uh, the whole thing down the yoke would lay back against uh, supports uh, and they were out of the way and uh, when it came time for you to pick it up and let the crucible get picked up uh, you would lift uh, you would have you have a an up and down button on on the little uh, crane above it and the the hook would pick it up and lift it out of the way 
and the guys would come with, in with the pouring shank like you're seeing now. Uh, you know, on the top half, you look at it, the right-hand side, uh, there was a, you know, there's a hinge that's welded to this cage that was manufactured. The left-hand side, there's another hinge welded to that. And then that portion of the cage was split so that when you took a pin out of the hinge, the other side would allow the hinge to open up like a door. You would, uh, with that side being open, you would just lift it up and over the crucible and the uh, operator, the, uh, the skimmer, would close that shank, put the pin back in the hinge, and then off you'd be able to go. You put it on the, uh, the stands next to the furnace. The guy would uh, clean up the, uh, the inside of the crucible with the, uh, the skimming uh, rod, and you would... Uh, Turn it uh, tilted a little bit so he can skim all the all the junk that was inside the uh, crucible off into the sand pit right in front of you, and then up and off you would go to pour the crucible. I mean, rather to pour the molds. Now, there's another one. Here's a one-man shore a pouring shank right here. This would be best for when you got a, a small crucible. The other one was like for a number 70 crucible that you could you could have as much as uh, 250, 300 pounds of material inside that crucible. All right. Uh, normally we didn't, but you could have as much as that. This would be more for a smaller crucible. A one man, you know, one man can easily pick it up, and uh, you know it opens up just like the other one with hinges, uh, with a loose pin in one one hinge and a fixed pin in the other. Open it up, put the uh, put the cage around the crucible, close it, put the pin back in, and off he goes to pour it. The next picture is showing a tilt furnace. Now, for the life of me, I can't remember uh, what the material was uh, the crucible was made of. I, I keep wanting to say it was a magnesia crucible or maybe alumina crucible I can't remember but magnesia keeps coming up in my mind anyway that crucible never gets out and is never uh, you're never touched by anything other than the uh, furnace operator and the metal that's going to be put into it it stays right there uh, that that lip that you see and the uh, I don't know I guess you might call it uh, the little hill that goes down to the lip of the crucible that's refractory cement that's rammed in and that's slicked off and that's allowed to dry for a long time and this is a uh, this looks like the uh, tilt furnace for the inducto inductotherm it looks almost exactly like the one we had on almost every ship I was on uh, with the exception of the Piedmont uh, AD 17 uh, destroyer send, or destroyer tender number 17 all of the uh, all of the uh, furnace setups was uh, you had your center console you had your on the left hand side of the console you had a lift coil furnace on the right hand side you had the tilt furnace and then uh, you know closer to you there was the pouring deck and then behind you would be the molding bench uh, you know, the only thing I remember about the Piedmont is that maybe the tilt furnace was on the left side and the and the lift coil was on the right hand side. Um, there's another picture of the lift coil. That doesn't look like yeah, it looks too nice to be anything that I've ever worked with, unless that's brand spanking new, getting ready to be shipped out. Here. You know, when I've neglected to say that the way you have the metal going to your molds is that you have what's called a bull ladle that uh, is is uh, being maneuvered on a crane. You know, you go, you bring the uh, bull ladle over to that lip. It raises up hydraulically, empties into the bull ladle, and then you uh, pour it in your mold. This uh, picture here is is showing 
a uh, a mold in in uh, San Diego being poured. What they're pouring is stainless steel. Now the guy on the right is Mr. Denbo. He used to be a uh, a senior chief molder, if I remember rightly. He uh, got into, or you know, I don't know if he uh, was a civil servant or or he got hired separate or anything. But he was he was uh, in charge of a lot of the the stuff over there. He, we weren't exactly working for him, but he gave us all the information we needed to get things done right. Uh, the guy with no silver suit on over to the left is Paxton. He was in an A school at the time. Uh, I think that might have been we're the nearest one. I don't know. He's got... can't tell who... Any of the rest of these guys, I'm just going to have to guess. Gundelfinger back then was a second class or a first class. He was running the furnace, the Ajax furnaces. And uh, the person, at least I can tell you at least this, the person who is sprinkling something on to the, what the risers are right there, uh, that's an exothermic uh, covering that allows the molten metal in the riser to stay hot even longer. Uh, they, what we were doing right then, I remember very well, was uh, pouring stainless steel making firefighting uh, water pumps for one of the newer, uh, I don't know, was it a frigate? I think it was a frigate. That I'll have to think about it. Anyway, it was a new frigate class uh, ship back in the, in the 70s. And uh, we made oh, probably a good 10 or 15 of them. It was a lot of work. Because that that stainless steel is a tough metal, not only tough to pour and tough uh, to cut, but it was tough to grind too. So it was a very good. Met uh, I learned a lot of stuff in the in 77, 78 time frame when I was in 32nd Street. One of the, I think of all the places I've ever been, that was the place I enjoyed the most because of all the stuff we ever did. Now the next picture, this is showing you what an Indecto uh, 100 looks like in the civilian world. That, that's the central console right there. Uh, looking at the bottom of the console, uh, there's a lever right to the lower right and there's a lever to the left side over there. If it's down, that furnace is not, is not being used. Like the one on the right-hand side, which in, on almost all my ships was our tilt furnace, that was, uh, that was not being used. That lever is open. That means no electricity was going to it. On the one all the way to the left, you can just about make out. It's all the way up. The lever is pushed in. That means that furnace on that side is going to be used. <coughs> this is a filthy furnace. No idea why it was that dirty. Uh, I don't know. Civilian civilians had less time to clean up. More more productive. Uh, more production was needed, I guess. Anyway, unless this is a really really old one, and that's wear natural wear and tear. But that sure looks like a lot of soot and a lot of a lot of uh, crap being from the uh, the pouring just getting on there and nobody ever cleaning up. Oh well, not my furnace, I guess. So, that's your basic, uh, your basic uh, rundown on what kind of furnaces there were. I mean, that's not all the furnaces that ever existed anywhere. I'm sure that I've missed probably a dozen different types of furnaces. Okay, but why tell you about furnaces being used in outer space when you're never ever ever going to use one? Okay. You got the chance of making your own cupola uh, furnace. As a matter of fact, the guys who are are you are are using uh, charcoal furnaces. That's the closest I've seen people use cupola furnaces. Just the back backyard uh, furn uh, backyard foundry men who are molders. Anyway, I've seen uh, you know the people in uh, in Britain. They have their 
there are schools over there, like big time uh, artists over there. They were using a, a cupola furnace. Uh, that was fun to watch. And uh, but there, there's and there's cupola furnaces being used around the world. All right, you could make your own. You could, uh, you knowing what you know how they how they're built now, you could make your own and just use. Like for instance, if I was going to make one, I would make one in your basic cupola shape. I would have charcoal start that off, pour a bunch of crushed aluminum cans on top, pour another couple of inches of charcoal on top of that, and just keep alternating it until I had uh, aluminum pouring out the bottom, filling up uh, whatever molds or ingot molds that I'd be uh, having nearby. You know, sounds like a, a nice. Uh, a nice uh, project. Maybe someday I'll, uh, you know, make one of those too, just to see how good it works. Okay. Uh, you got your, you got your reverberatory furnaces. I know those exist uh, because you're there using them to uh, manufacture steel in many parts of the world. Obviously, they have uh, the oil-fired furnaces still. Now the oil fire furnace, the, that was the first one we ever learned uh, in A school uh, because it was the least dangerous even though it was compressed air and compressed gas. Uh, basically you had a furnace in the ground with a lid that when it was time to take the crucible out you would lift it with a rod and roll it back. You know it was uh, most of the weight was put on the little wheels and uh, then you would take a uh, lifting shank, two guys would lift the crucible out, put it in the middle of a pouring shank, two guys would pick up the pouring shank and run off with it to the molds. Okay, You have, uh, many, many people has have the uh, same fuel, basic fuel oil furnace, even if all you're using is the um, uh, LP gas, or rather, uh, oh, I keep wanting to say petroleum gas, but that ain't it. Anyway, gas, natural gas. Okay, even if you're just using natural gas and you're not using atomized uh, uh, fuel oil, you're still using what the same design as a oil-fired furnace. Something I learned many years ago. Now there's, uh, you you know, you oh, if you're uh, the kind of guy that uh, has a lot of electrical background and you want to build an electric arc furnace, you can certainly do that. Not too likely you're going to get uh, electrodes, uh, you know, three inch in diameter electrodes. I can't speak for you. you maybe you have them in your back pocket now, but uh, the odds are you'd be able to find yourself some uh, some smaller graphite electrodes and then build an electric arc furnace. I myself, I, I'm, a, I'm a retired uh, electrician. I wouldn't fool with it, you know. <coughs> but it would be a good, uh, a good, something you could actually build. Uh, a rocking indirect arc furnace. You could build one of those. Uh, it would take a lot of money, but you could build one of those. I mean, everybody has uh, the materials and the talent that they could build one. Indir I, I have seen people building uh, the induction furnaces. Okay, I've seen them on the uh, YouTube and all that. And uh, people who making like even just a one coil induction uh, setup, where they took uh, a single coil, set uh, you know, had it connected to a control panel, and then was able to turn a piece of uh, steel stock white hot in 10 seconds. You know, how much uh, easier would it be to make a multi-coil uh, induction furnace? Put it, uh, put a regular clay graphite crucible in the middle of it, and pour molten metal. That would be one of the the fastest and cleanest ways of working with metal but you would have a hell of a uh, you know electrical bill maybe it's still possible though you can still do it alright and so 
now, uh, in a second, I'm going to uh, get on the uh, actual uh, the uh, GoPro and, and take you out into my little fir little foundry and uh, show you what my furnace looks like, the one I built. Uh, so far, so good on that furnace. It, did, it hasn't fallen apart on me yet, so I got I'm pretty uh, confident uh, with it. Uh, so if you wait a second, we'll be right back. Okay, now I'm going to uh, show you the little furnace that I made. Did a little bit of uh, melting of lead yesterday. This is my new little uh, lead pot that I bought. The stuff that I've been buying as much as I can. I lean on McMaster Car. McMaster Car has has so much of the stuff that I can utilize that uh, if I didn't have McMaster Car, and no, I'm not being paid to talk about them. If I hadn't been uh, had their online, you know, uh, catalog to rely on, I wouldn't be near as far along as I am right now. Okay. Bought that pot. Basically, it's going to be my lead pot, my zinc pot, and my uh, the pot for pouring babbit if I ever do it. Low low melting temperature pot, right there. Okay. Uh, it's just scrap. What I was melting was the uh, plates inside of a battery backup that you know it had gone bad. And I don't know. There's a lot less, lot less there than I wanted, you know, when it comes to uh, generating lead. But what it did do is it did give me at least uh, half as much again lead. Half this lead came from those plates. Which is not bad. Anyway, and I basically all I did is just put it on this turkey cooker and, uh, you know, melted it down with that. Okay, so here's my little furnace. Now, the shell I got from McMaster and Carr. The tube or pipe, solid pipe, same thing, got from McMaster and Carr. This is my lid. I'm going to have to modify this lid, I believe, because when I put the lid on there, even after I've got this going, uh, you know, I've got this inside making some heat. Well, it's not, uh, you know, there's too much back pressure for some reason when I have the lid on there. Like there's not enough vent, not enough hole for all of this to continue making uh, flame and when I hear it starting to get very you know very dull I pick it up and all of a sudden I've got a poof and we've got the places inside is uh, full of un unburnt fuel you know it's ne it was never a bad thing but at least I was paying attention enough to where it didn't get concentrated in there and blow the lid off I'm just going to have to make that lid, you know, a lot more vented. We'll try it out. Anyway, so, bought the, uh, bought the shell from McMaster Car. Bought the pipe from McMaster and Car. The insulation here, the refractory, got that from, uh, crime any, well, budget supply. Budget casting supply, budget casting supply out in California. Um, now, I got it uh, a couple, three years ago, and when the last time I was looking over budget casting supplies stuff, they didn't have it listed anymore. Don't know if they still have it or not, but I had one bag that I hadn't used, and using a 12 inch 
casting, you know, those 12 inch forms you can put into the ground and pour cast, or rather pour cement into them and make a post base. Well, that's what I did. So I put that in the middle down here, filled in the gap with the uh, refractory, dry refractory, and then filled in the remainder of the room with perlite. I had never used that before, uh, but I did study up on it. And basically, perlite is obsidian, you know, volcanic glass that had been uh, foamed up in some way. You know, obsidian as if somebody had, had injected a whole lot of uh, air into it. And that's what it looks like when it's all foamed up, okay? Uh, well, that melting temperature is well below the aluminum melting temperature, or rather well above, I should say, well above the temperature of uh, molten aluminum, uh, which is likely to be the only thing I, I melt at the house here, and uh, so I'm not worried about it. And when I was mixing it, I mixed it, of course, in my mixer over here. I put all the refractory cement in there. I put all of the perlite in there. Then I just added let's say a gallon, maybe even just a half a gallon of water in there, and the refractory cement and perlite, oh no, I, I, that's what I did. I went and uh, mixed it dry for three or four minutes so that all of the perlite that was in there would be fully uh, coated by the refractory, and, and it was. There wasn't a bit of uh, white perlite anymore. And then I just added water until this stuff flowed in the mixer like, I don't know, like uh, the stuff you would see flowing in a, a mudslide. All right. It wasn't water, but it also was a lot thicker or rather a lot wetter than I would have done if I'd had regular uh, foundry refractory, you know, the kind of stuff we uh, made, made uh, linings in the induction furnace, you know. It was considerably wetter than that, but then again, I was pouring it into that. There wasn't any holes in it, uh, except for that on the side, and I had that well sealed. And it solidified just great. I put it, I put it uh, through a sintering, you know, brought it up to better than a thousand degrees. Didn't see a, a single blister, not a single bulge anywhere there was no no uh, degradation of the surface at all so this looks like it's going to be a pretty good little lining for me and uh what i i well as i may have already said i am going to be using propane and going to be using that torch unless it winds up not being good enough and then i might might uh First thing I'm going to try is I'm going to have that putting gas inside the container and then I might uh, make a, uh, a tube to uh, inject LP air in there like extra, you know, uh, oxygen in there and see if that gives me more power. But needless to say, or beside all that, this here is my furnace. That is where the furnace gets put when it's done. And uh, this will be the end of the information on furnaces. If anybody has any questions about furnaces, I'll be glad to look them up if I don't already know them. Like I used to say in the Navy, uh, I may not know, know it, but I'll look it up for you. Okay, the end of the, of the uh, information. And to all of you who know what I mean, Liberty Call. Okay, now I'm going to uh, show you the little furnace that I made. Did a little bit of uh, melting of lead yesterday. This is my new little uh, lead pot that I bought. The stuff that I've been buying as much as I can. I lean on McMaster Car. McMaster Car has has so much of the stuff that I can utilize that uh, if I didn't have McMaster Car, 
and no, I'm not being paid to talk about them. If I hadn't been uh, had their online, you know, uh, catalog to rely on, I wouldn't be near as far along as I am right now. Okay, bought that pot. Basically, it's going to be my lead pot, my zinc pot, and my uh, the pot for pouring babbitt if I ever do it. Low low melting temperature pot, right there. Okay. Uh, it's just scrap. What I was melting was the uh, plates inside of a battery backup that, you know, it had gone bad. And I don't know, there's a lot less, lot less there than I wanted, you know, when it comes to uh, generating lead. But what it did do is it did give me at least uh, half as much again lead half this lead came from those plates which is uh, not bad anyway and I basically all I did is just put it on this turkey cooker and uh, you know melted it down with that okay so here's my little furnace now the shell I got from McMaster and Carr. The tube or pipe, solid pipe, same thing, got from McMaster and Carr. This is my lid. I'm going to have to modify this lid, I believe, because when I put the lid on there, even after I've got this going, uh, you know, I've got this inside making some heat. Well, it's not, uh, you know, there's too much back pressure for some reason when I have the lid on there. Like, there's not enough vent, not enough hole for all of this to continue making uh, flame. And when I hear it starting to get very, you know, very dull, I pick it up and... All of a sudden I've got a poof and we've got the places inside is uh, full of un unburnt fuel you know it's ne it was never a bad thing but at least I was paying attention enough to where it didn't get concentrated in there and blow the lid off I'm just gonna have to make that lid you know a lot more vented we'll try it out anyway so bought the uh, bought the shell from McMaster car Bought the pipe from McMaster and Carr. The insulation here, the refractory, got that from uh, Criminy. Well, Budget Supply, Budget Casting Supply, Budget Casting Supply out in California. Um, now, I got it uh, a couple, three years ago, and when the last time I was looking over Budget Casting Supplies, stuff they didn't have it listed anymore don't know if they still have it or not but i had one bag that i hadn't used and using a 12 inch uh casting you know those 12 inch forms you can put into the ground and pour cast or rather pour cement into them and make a post base well that's what i did so i put that in the middle down here filled in the gap with the uh, refractory, dry refractory, and then filled in the remainder of the room with perlite. I'd never used that before, uh, but I did study up on it. And basically, perlite is obsidian, you know, volcanic glass that had been uh, foamed up in some way. You know, obsidian, as if somebody had, had injected a whole lot of uh, air into it and that's what it looks like when it's all foamed up okay uh, well that melting temperature is well below the aluminum melting temperature or rather well above I should say well above the temperature